this webinar will focus on the introduction to biopsying of cells. So I will focus on the biopsy equipment setup, the choice of micro tools to be used, the methods used for biopsying, as well as give you troubleshooting tips. This is the structure of the presentation. So first of all, we will focus on trophectoderm biopsy for PGT about the procedure itself. Then we'll focus in detail on the laboratory preparations, the biopsy procedure itself. We will then uh, zoom into some factors influencing the PGT result, and then we will summarize. So let's start with the trophectoderm biopsy procedure process. Now, pre-implantation genetic testing is a test performed to analyze the DNA from oocytes or embryos. And this can be done to determine genetic abnormalities or for HLA typing. And this was defined in the International Glossary on Infertility and Fertility Care. There are three types of PGT. PGT-A, where A stands for aneuploidy testing. And this is where one screens for chromosome abnormalities. PGT-M, M stands for monogenic diseases. So here we will screen for specific single gene disorders. And the third PGT type is the pre-implantation genetic testing SR. And SR stands for structural rearrangements, where the screening is done for inherited chromosome rearrangements. Now, in order to go through a PGT process, the patient will have to go IVF and or ICSI. So uh, after hyperstimulation, oocytes are recruited, they are being fertilized, and embryos are cultured. And here we will focus on biopsying of the day five, the blastocyst stage embryo. And when these cells have been biopsied, they will be tubed, sent to the genomics laboratory for testing. They will then pr provide a report which state which of the embryos are genetically normal. In the meantime, the embryos are vitrified, so they are stored until the diagnosis, the testing result is, uh, is in. And from the testing result, we can then identify those embryos that are genetically healthy. They can be warmed and transferred to the patient and healthfully, help, hopefully lead to a healthy pregnancy. So today we are going to focus on the biopsy technique itself. And the biopsy technique of uh, blastocyst is mainly focused on taking cells from the trophectoderm. As we all know, the trophectoderm aligns the blastocyst cavity and the inner cell mass uh, will form into the fetus while the trophectoderm cells will form into the placenta. And on day five, we can see different stages of development on those blastocysts. It could be a young blastocyst, it could be expanding, it could be a hatching blastocyst or completely hatched blastocyst from the zona pellucida. So the idea is to take trophectoderm cells and send those off for testing in the genomics laboratory. So what do we need to do in our laboratory in, in terms of preparation? First of all, the culture system uh, is different. So we need to make sure that we have a single embryo culture system. This means that you will have to be able to identify each single embryo in that culture procedure. If this is not uh, in place as yet, so that's a new technique that you will have to introduce into your laboratory. Because we are testing and biopsying individual embryos, this will mean that you will have um, an impact on your culture system because there will be increased incubator door openings and dish movements. There will be increased number of dishes per patient per incubator or per chamber. And the time lapse is excellent for monitoring the development of the embryos. But here as well, you will have to remove the complete uh, slide or culture system to take out embryo and per embryo for the biopsying and then returning them to culture. So there is an impact on your culture system. And also not only for the patient that you are doing for your PGT case, but also for the other patients who have their embryo cultured in the same incubator. So you have to focus on how to improve and how to guarantee the best culture conditions. 
You also will need a micro manipulator, a laser. So that could be an active laser that will move to the cellular material that you or the zona pellucida where you want to, it to be used. It could also be a fixed laser where you will move then the embryo to the laser point at the microscopic stage. A different powers uh, should be used and a more powerful laser will require a much shorter pulse length to create the desired hole size. The latest generation lasers also have a very low heat noise, so the heat stays concentrated on the spot where you are lasering. Air or oil syringes are also uh, absolutely necessary for good at, at biopsying. The latest generation of air systems is e excellent to do the biopsying, so make sure you have high quality equipment to do this kind of work on your mi micro manipulator. Now the biopsy itself will induce some stress on the embryo and we are taking them out of their protected environment in the incubator so we have to ensure that during this outside stay of the incubator we will minimize the stress on the embryos during our micro manipulations. And one of the things is of course the temperature, the pH and the osmolality. These parameters should not change when the embryos are outside of their incubators. So for this, we will use a pH stable medium. This can be with HEPAs or MOPs or both. And we will use an oil overlay so there are no changes in uh, temperature or osmolality. And then you will have to decide many things, actually. You will have to set criteria for what type of embryos you will biopsy. Will you biopsy all embryos, all qualities, all grades? At what stage of development will you biopsy? Will this be only those embryos that are hatching? Or will you also biopsy those that have not hatched by opening the zona pellucida and pulling out embryos? So this is a criteria that you have to set before you start your project. You can do IVF insemination and you can do ICSI insemination. IVF is possible because uh, for the uh, genomic testing with Cooper Genomics, uh, the DNA of the sperm will not be amplified. So IVF can be used, but check with your genomic provider if that is the case for you. But in any way, we can introduce foreign DNA by leaving cumulus cells on the zona pellucida. And while biopsying, if we take one of those cumulus cells in the biopsy pipette, well, then we are creating um, artificial uh, mosaicism. So we, we create a contamination because that DNA, this maternal DNA, will also be amplified. So ensure that all cumulus cells are removed at time of fertilization check in case of IVF. And in case of ICSI, ensure that they are removed at time of denudation and or fertilization check. We will biopsy five to, two, to 10 cells to have the highest uh, meaningful mosaicism analyses and to re um, reduce the no result rate. Now we will go into detail why we came to those five to 10 cells range. And of course, consistency and experience in biopsying is key. You need to train and you, before you start and you need to monitor your quality while you are doing this work in the lab. And then the manual double witnessing system is really mandatory and it is needed at all steps. So it needs to be robust and it needs to maintain the chain of custody. So these steps will be then in and out of the biopsy dish movement of embryos, the time of the tubing you will need witnessing, reculturing of the embryo, the time of the moment of the vitrification, the identification of the healthy embryo for transfer, as well as at the time of the warming of the embryo and the transfer of the embryo. So all these steps need to have a really good double witnessing system. Of course, we want to uh, biopsy uh, trophectoderm cells, and ideally, that's the easiest way I find, is that these cells are hatching through the zona pellucida. And to obtain this, we could use assisted hatching. And we, for, to do this, we will make an opening of 5 to 20 micrometers, depending on the test technique that you will use. Later on for biopsying, we will go into detail. So you make an opening in the zona pellucida, 
And then uh, this will be done. You can do that on day three or day four, even in the morning of day five. But try to find a spot where the perivitelin space is still very large so that if there is heat noise, this, this will not damage the cells of the embryos close to that opening point. If it is already a blastocyst or a young blastocyst, you will go to the area opposite of the inner cell mass. And then we need high quality biopsy pipettes and handling pipettes. So for the biopsy pipettes, um, we need, we really recommend that you change those between the embryos because you can induce contamination with foreign DNA from one embryo to the other. The biopsy pipette ranges um, in our diameter 18 to 22 or 23 to 27. Try smaller and larger. You have to really find what works best for you. But uh, most of the operators use these sizes. If you take a too large biopsy pipette, you will aspirate too many embryo, uh, too many cells, sorry. And this would then make life more difficult when you want to remove them from the embryo. Uh, the holding pipette is like the standard holding pipette that you would use for your ICSIs. But again, ask for some samples, try and test what works the best for you. Key is that with these uh, pipettes, you have excellent control of the cells that are in your pipettes. So the biopsy pipette needs a good injector system, but the pipette itself needs to be of good quality as well. Handling pipettes, so those you will need to uh, move the sample and to wash the embryo or to bring the embryo into the biopsy dish. Well, here as well, we recommend to change those between embryos because, again, you can contaminate the samples. For sample handling, we recommend between 75 and 150, but some operators prefer larger pipettes. Smaller is more difficult. Smaller than 75, I find more, more difficult. So this is the optimal range that we advise. For embryo washing, we, we advise 275 micrometer uh, pipette because if you go smaller, you have the risk that you will uh, remove the blastocyst from its zona pellucida. Okay, so now let's focus on the biopsy procedure itself. And for this, of course, we need to prepare our biopsy dish. This is a standard ICSI dish, the same dish you use for your ICSIs, um, nine millimeter height dish. And we will prepare these dishes at room temperature. We will make three drops in the dish of 10 to 20 microliter of a HEPAS and or MOPS buffered medium. Then we will put oil on top. So it's a layer of pre-warm mineral oil. And then we will incubate these dishes for at least 30 minutes so they have the correct temperature. And this is, of course, in a non-gassed incubator before we start the biopsy procedure. While these um, dishes are incubating, we are going to check our laser, if it is still aligned and functioning well, if it's hitting the point that we want it to hit. We will check the temperature of the heated stage and we will install our holding and biopsy pipette. Not, let's start doing the biopsy. We will label the biopsy dish with the name of the patient and the number of the embryo. So that will be the same code as you are using on your sheets and the same number and code that you will use on the tubing, uh, on the tube where you will put in the cells. Then we will take the blastocyst with a large uh, handling pipette and we will bring it into the first drop in our dish. Here we will do a washing to remove the medium that does not have the HEPAS, so we don't want to dilute our HEPAS and our MOPS buffered medium, and then we will bring it into drop number two. Of course, a witness needs to confirm that we are putting embryo number one, for example, into dish number one. This dish is then brought under the inverted microscope, and we are then going to prime our biopsy and handling pipette in drop number one. And we will test if it, the handling and a, a biopsy system, the injection aspiration system is working well. So two in drop two, finally, we will do our biopsy. So when this is uh, the priming and the testing of the pipettes has been done, we will move those to drop number two. 
Now, at that point, you will have to define your strategy to BIOPS. So this depends on the quality and the uh, development of the embryo. So for example, embryo A has a large ICM, beautiful trophectoderm, but there's no hatching. So we will approach with the biopsy cut from this side, we will first make an opening and take out the cells from this side. Oh, sorry. Embryo number B has already a hatching part of trophectoderm cells. And these are like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine maybe. So that should be enough for our biopsy. The ICM is quite close to that part, but it should not, it should not uh, interfere with the biopsy itself. So how are we going to approach this? We are going to take those cells for biopsy. Embryo number C, however, is slightly difficult, quality is not optimal, and it seems that we have two ICMs, but there is a part here of trophectoderm cells, so we would approach and this way, and we're going to focus to take cells from this part. Embryo number D is even poorer quality. Um, the ICM is like spiked and has several um, arms, so to speak, in the embryo. So we need to be able to take some cells from here or from here. And I think this even is a better option because these cells have look like they have a better quality. So you have to check your embryo when you have, uh, what before you're going to start and set up your strategy for biopsy. So think ahead, make a plan how to approach this biopsy. There are two biopsy techniques in use uh, globally. And the first one is lasering and stretch. And the second one is laser and flick. So for laser and stretch, the idea is that you aspirate the cells that you want to biops. You are start pulling on those cells and you will laser. And by stretching and pulling and lasering, you will remove those cells. The second technique consists of lasering and flick. The starting point is the same. You will aspirate the cells. Then you will remove the embryo from the holding pipette. Um, you will uh, laser one or two or three maximum shots. And then you will pull down this, this border of the cells against the holding pipette. And in this way, the biopsy cells will be removed. Now let's have a look at some examples. This is the laser and stretch technique. First of all, we will uh, clamp the embryo at the holding pipette here at the side of the inner cell mass. We try to have a horizontal line. We will approach with the aspiration or biopsy pipette to these cells. We will start aspirating the cells in our biopsy pipette and we will start pulling. As you can see by the pulling, the stretching, there must have been a damage to a cell connection and the blastocoelic cavity of these hatching cells has collapsed. That's no problem. So don't panic. It's totally normal. Then we will hit on those cell junctions with the laser maximum of three times. And we continue to stretch and pull. And then the cell junctions will break. And then you will have obtained your trophectoderm sample that will then be uh, washed and tubed. So here is a sample from that specific embryo. We will remove the embryo from the holding pipette. We will remove the holding pipette from the biopsy dish, and then we will remove the sample from the pipette. So let's have a look. This is a little video demonstrating just that. So we're positioning the embryo with the ICM on the holding pipette. Don't aspirate too much, but gentle aspiration is more than good enough. We focus on those cells of that hatched uh, group and we will bring in our aspiration biopsy pipette quite close to that area. Here it is. Bring both in the same plane. And now you start aspirating, but very slowly. It's just like aspirating a sperm in your ICSI procedure, but control is key. So as you could see, there is a, a collapse at some point. It's no problem. We are stretching, we are lasering on those cell connections and pulling at the same time. So still not broken. So we will have to laser again and then continue to pull. And here we are. The sample is freed.
And this is the embryo after the biopsy. So that was the laser and stretch technique. Now I will explain the laser and flick technique. The starting point is exactly the same. We, we will position the embryo with the ICM in this case towards the holding pipette. We will try to have it in a horizontal line. These cells will be biopsed, so we will go with the a biopsy pipette. We'll focus on these cells and start aspirating. You can see here as well, this little group had some blastocystic cavity and this has collapsed, so you aspirate those cells. Next step will then be to uh, block the aspiration. So this is a neutral aspiration position. We will laser maximum of three shots and the intensity is the same as you would make a six to 10 micrometer hole size. And then we will remove the embryo from the holding pipette. We will bring it on top of the holding pipette and we then will uh, quickly, quickly pull down this biopsy pipette along the holding pipette. And in this way, we will free the cells from the embryo itself. Next step is then to remove the holding from the uh, biopsy drop, move, a, move away from the embryo, and then gently, slowly, slowly release those cells from the pipette. Again, here there should be in the big, uh, neutral aspiration so that you will not end up aspirating those uh, cells into your biopsy pipette. And then slowly, slowly flushing them out. And here is the sample, uh, but at higher magnification. So let's look at that live as well. Here the embryo is positioned against the holding. These cells have been aspirated in the biopsy pipette. The aspiration here is neutral in this pipette. So we will now focus with our optics on this holding pipette. We will bring the embryo on top in the same focal plane, and then we will test with the uh, biopsy pipette that we are in the middle of this holding pipette. Again, this is neutral aspiration, and we will then quickly bring down the pipette along the holding pipette. And here you are, the biopsed embryo. We will move away from the embryo and then release the cells. So once that's done, we will move our biopsy dish back to the stereo microscope. We will label our post biopsy culture dish. So that's the culture dish that we take from our incubator with patient's ID and each drop in there with the embryo number. And then with a large handling pipette, we will prime that pipette with the culture medium. We will take out the biopsed blastocyst and then bring it to uh, washing drops and culture it. There, of course, a witness needs to be present to check on us that we are removing embryo number one from the biopsy dish number one and washing it and bring it into culture a drop number one. Make sure that you don't aspirate the cell sample while moving or handling this embryo from the biopsy dish. Standard, you can do uh, vitrification. So uh, within 30 minutes, so best to wait 30 minutes before you do your vitrification, but use the vitrification procedure that you have as a standard technique in your lab. So if you are used to collapsing the embryo, you, you can uh, vitrify those collapse or you induce collapse of embryo. If you do not collapse your embryos, don't do it. Just start with the standard vitrification procedure in, that you are used to in your lab. Make sure you do not vitrify before the tubing is finished. This is key because if you lose the cells during the tubing and you have vitrified the embryo, then you need to warm it again, culture it and re so that's extra stress for that embryo. The biopsy dish should be kept at room temperature. So the biopsy dish with your sample in your flow cabinet until your tubing procedure starts. Witness and lock all steps in the patient file. Now, there are some factors that will influence the quality of your PGT result. A poor quality sample can be the result of too many laser hits, so increased laser exposure or high intensity, multiple flicking or scraping of the sample against your holding pipette, or overstretching it. 
And this then can lead to false positive mosaic data as been demonstrated by different authors already. Another factor that will influence the quality of your PGT result is the quality of the embryo itself, the quality of the trophectoderm. And the study of Zhang really nicely shows this, uh, where they have analyzed different qualities of trophectoderm cells and in the embryo, and then compared it to the implantation, resulting implantation rate. So when taking one to five cells, the dark blue bar, or 6 to 10, 11 to 15, or 16 to 41 cells from those grade A embryos or grade B, these have poor trophectoderm quality, or grade C, those have very poor quality, they could clearly see that the number of cells from those top quality embryos with top quality trophectoderm did not influence the implantation rate of those embryos. For grade B trophectoderm and grade C, however, there was a significant influence linked to the number of cells that were biopsied. So here already we have an idea that we should not take more than 10 cells. So between one and five is optimal, but we also have to look at the diagnostic result. And then another study focused on this. They looked at the diagnostic failure rate on the Y bar compared, uh, linked to the biopsy TE cell numbers. So this is the cell number one, two, three, four, five, and so on that were biopsied. And they could clearly see that if it was only one cell biopsied, the failure rate was almost 14%. And the more cells were biopsied, the less the diagnostic failure rate was. So you can see that if you take more than five cells, your failure rate is almost zero. So hence, that's why we advise to take between five and 10 cells. Another factor that will influence your PGT result is the quality and the experience of the operators. So those uh, experts that are taking the cells, biopsying the embryos, culturing the embryos, but also vitrifying and warming the embryos. And the study of Kapalpo clearly demonstrates that it is possible to get the same quality of all your operators so that the pregnancy rate, even if operator A, B, or C is working on the biopsy or the tubing, will not uh, will result sorry, in the same outcomes, in the good outcomes. But of course, training is key and monitoring those qualities is absolutely key. So here in this study, they use the KPI pregnancy rate, biochemical pregnancy rate, miscarriage rate, and ongoing implantation rate. But I think you could, should also focus on the quality of the work during the procedure. So you could look at the, how long did the biopsy take? Uh, was there a loss of cells? Um, uh, what was the survival of the embryo immediately after biopsying, after 24 hours, after vitrification and warming? what is the noise rate, what is the diagnosis failure rate for each specific operator. So these are all KPIs that you could uh, note and evaluate in a specific timely way. Okay, so lots of information. Let's now summarize. So trophectoderm biopsy for PGT requires a high blastocyst development rate and an optimized culture system and excellent vitrification program in your laboratory, in your clinic. If you don't have an excellent vitrification program, first of all, you have to focus on bringing that up to the excellent level. Because if we do have good biopsying and nice blastocyst and they will not survive your vitrification procedure, it is clear that PGT will not work for you and will not improve the outcomes. So make sure that you have a really solid IVF quality in your lab. It may require changes in your laboratory workflow. As you've heard, there will be, uh, there will be work done at, uh, and equipment will be used that also can be used for the ICSI procedure. So when will you do the biopsy? Will that clash with when you do the ICSIs or the embryo transfer? Do you need more staffing? It will require changes in your laboratory workflow. You need high quality equipment. Otherwise, the uh, level of your work, the quality of your work will not be optimal. So 
invest in a good microscope, invest in good aspiration systems. The biopsy procedure can be done at different time points, so when the embryos are hatching, but it could also be that you decide that you will biopsy them at specific time slots in the day for that specific patient. So again, you need to decide on that and that will influence the laboratory workflow. You have to have a robust witnessing system for all those steps in the biopsying, but also in the cell preparation. And we will talk about that tomorrow. Training is really key. Initial training before you going to introduce it into your clinic can be done for the biopsying uh, in an external training on an animal model. Go and visit the laboratory where they're already doing this. And so you can observe. And when you start it in your clinic, you have to have your own training and validation procedure. One method is to, um, if this is the possible in your clinic, that you use uh, donated embryos for training, but make sure you have informed consent that these patients have signed up for this and all is traceable that you can always see which embryos were used and record all, all the um, necessary data. How long did it take you to do the biopsy? Was the embryo surviving immediately or after 24 hours and so on? Ongoing competency assessment is also key. So you have to keep monitoring if your team or yourself are, is doing well. Do you have the same quality time and time again? Or is it changing? Is there protocol drift? And this you can only do if you note all those key performance indicators that we discussed. The quality of your biopsy technique will affect the PGT result and also the embryo viability. So make sure that your quality of work is excellent. So thank you very much. And now I'm open to take questions.